My name is Noah Askin. I am an uh, assistant professor of organizational behavior at INSEAD. Um, I'm in my fifth year. I uh, did my PhD at the University of Chicago, actually a joint PhD between Booth, the business school, the organizations and markets group, and the sociology department, uh, which was nice to be able to bring some disciplinary uh, credibility to, to everything that I'm doing. So music um, is something that I've always loved and been interested in. I'm a terrible musician, but I've always loved music and was looking for ways to try to study it um, basically from the beginning of even when I was applying to the PhD. And part of the reason why I got into it was actually Damon Phillips, who was studied jazz, was a professor at Booth. And I was like, wait, you can do this and study jazz and be a business school professor? I was like, that sounds cool. I, I should look into this. And, um, and shortly after that, once I had started in the PhD program, at Booth, I came across someone, and I honestly don't remember who it was, at AOM one year, and she was, I think, a pretty new faculty member, and she was asking me, like, oh, what, what do you do? You're a PhD student, what are you interested in? And I said, music, and she laughed, and she said, oh, you should save that till after you have tenure. And I was like, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to do that. Uh, and so fast forward another year or two, and I was at a Booth Kellogg PhD student uh, conference where we just present a little bit of work, and I met a first or second year PhD student at Kellogg named Michael Muskoff who had already had a PhD in musicology and we just started talking about mutual interests. I was a third or fourth year at the time and we're like oh we should look into doing something around this and kind of one thing led to another and we, st we found some interesting data sets and, and figured out ways to start scraping those data sets and, and started this whole project. And, Sure, people have definitely pushed back at times. Creative industries, how relevant, what kinds of questions can you ask? But I think that we've, we've both found ways of asking questions that are relevant to org theory, econ, soc, business more generally. Um, and also I think the field is becoming much more open to these sorts of questions and, and these contexts. Um, you know, I'm part of a creative industries conference that Candy Jones at Edinburgh started and it's really wonderful for building community around people that are studying food, art, architecture, music, um, uh, fashion, those sorts of things. So there's definitely like a growing movement of people that are interested in these things. Plus I just think they're more inherently interesting. Uh, so you give talks on these topics and people are always like, they have their own theories and own opinions and anecdotal evidence, but I think that's good. It draws people in. If you look at sort of the issues, more environmental global issues that industries are facing now, the entertainment and creative industries were some of the first ones to face them, right? You look at the music industry and in the late 90s, early 2000s went through the biggest sort of disruption case that media is now going through, which I mean maybe isn't quite the same as a creative industry, but is, is certainly applicable there. And you look at so many other businesses now that are dealing with digital transformation and dealing with digital disruption and, and the creative industries in some respects were on the front lines of those and have had to deal with them and evolve and change. And yeah, their structures are different, but if you look across lots of industries, organizational and, and um, industry structures are different. So in that regard, I think the boundary conditions are similar. And in some ways, I think that they're nice analogs for, for what a lot of businesses are facing now. Creative industries are very identity-based, right? What, you, what type of music you like says a lot about who you are and who you identify with. And I think a lot of products and services these days are starting to play, and not just starting, have been playing that identity game for a long time. Um, and so, oh, you, you, you drive this kind of car, it's an identity issue. You, you use a Mac versus a PC, that's an identity. And so these are things that anybody selling any kind of product are, are going to be interested in and, and curious about the dynamics. So I think there's definitely more applicability than maybe it got historically got credit for. But I, like I said, I think people are starting to catch on to that more or be open to it more and more. It, I actually give a lot of thought to this question because I'm honestly not entirely sure from the producer's perspective. Um, you know, I mentioned that I have a project that I'm looking at 
from songwriters, and it's developing a theory based on a case of how songwriters develop uh, songs. And the idea is thinking about an evolutionary model of strategy development, so variation, selection, retention, um, really focusing on the first two and trying to balance selection within the variation, and that's the coming up with new ideas and being distinct and different, and, and selection where you're trying to be a little bit more focused on goals and trying to make sure that you have found something that's going to match what you want and what an audience potentially wants, but also making sure that there's some creativity involved in that, and so it's a balance across these two stages. And so I think from a producer's perspective, there is I don't know if it's a temporality so much as it is there is something sequential going on, um, which I guess assumes a level of temporality. But I think you know the idea of having boundaries in mind when you're brainstorming, and so when you're getting these wild and crazy, differentiated, highly unique ideas, keeping in mind like, okay, where are we going with this and not getting too, too far afield is important. And at the same time, balancing then when you've decided, okay, I now have generated enough wild and crazy ideas now what am I what are we actually going to go with here you know building in also some creativity there and allowing yourself to be flexible um, and so I think there is some sequential nature to the way that it's developed from a producer side as a consumer I think the two stages happen so far apart in the sense that like I like these various genres or these various bands fine now any new song that enters my sort of world and as my listening possibility is like, okay, I'm measuring based on what I know. I've already selected into this group or into this level of interest or, or, and so it's not really happening on an individual song. There it's like, yeah, does this sound exactly like everything else they've done? In which case I'm probably not that interested, but I might be en interested enough if I like the genre enough or the band, but is it actually enough to sort of stand out and, and stick in my mind? And so, in that, from that perspective, I think there is probably a temporality to it, but I think they're highly decoupled. Um, I don't think it's happening at the level of the, of the introduction of a new song or a new, if you're going to analyze or um, make an analogy to other areas, it's do I like this already? And so I've selected in, and now it's what's going to stand out for me? What am I going to really latch on to? Um, so the differentiation process is really what's happening in the moment. Sure, so with the caveat that this has not yet been published, so always subject to, uh, to updating. But, um, but we were interested in looking at uh, gender-related differences. And, and so what we've done is we've taken solo artists, solo male artists, solo female artists, and recognizing that this is a gender binary that some people may take issue with, but in terms of the way that, that it's historically been classified and, and the way that, that um, people tend to sort of latch on to what's going on in the music industry with specific musicians, we're taking that as our kind of starting, starting point slash caveat. Um, and we're interested in saying, okay, we now have access to more objective features. There always will be subjectivity involved, right? These are machine lear learning algorithms that are extracting features from songs, and so there is, a, there is subjectivity built into any kind of algorithm. Um, but it's, that subjectivity is at least consistent across, uh, and so you're getting to closer to ground truth of like what is the actual content of what's being created. And we said, you know, this is a relatively new development. We can actually ask some interesting questions about differences. And so what we've done is basically taken solo artists, male and female, and said, okay, are there any differences in the actual creativity of the songs that they're producing? And what we find is at a baseline comparison level, there are no differences. Um, however, when you start to introduce this kind of social processes that are involved from the artist side, how long they've been in the industry, how many collaborators they have, how many female collaborators they have, um, uh, what genres they're affiliated with, and whether they those are clusters of genres where more women or more men tend to tend to cluster together. When you start accounting for these things, we actually find that female artists are putting out more creative songs. And so we can't necessarily trace back to how they got signed in the first place and the whole realm of potential artists who never get signed or never release something officially. But what we think is that it's, it's a higher hurdle question, meaning that 
women actually have to be more creative in order to break into the industry and to remain in the industry. And we show effects over time, how that changes, and we show effects based on all these different factors and, and clustering dynamics that we think lends to the, the ultimate conclusion that this is what's taking place. And so women, women and men are putting out songs that just from a purely baseline level, no difference in creativity or in novelty as we've constructed it, but actually when you start to factor in the social dynamics around it and that artists are kind of having to deal with, women are putting out more creative songs. <laughs> it's a good question, right? And because you're thinking, if people know that this is happening, why would they, how would they fall for it? And I, I guess I have two answers or responses to that. One, we showed that actually over time that's not a necessarily effective strategy. Over several years, the schools that are raising their prices as a means of trying to either signal or recapture status are not necessarily succeeding in doing so, at least not, not dramatically. Um, so that's one. And then two, I think it only works when you have these, what we call and what others have called experience goods, right? And so you don't really know the value and you don't really know the ROI until after you've experienced them. And so then, yes, you can change the price and I can even know that you're changing the price. But because A, the experience and the return is going to be somewhat idiosyncratic to everybody that goes through, and B, I still don't know what that is until I go through it myself, it's a little bit more feasible, even if I'm aware that you're doing it. Because, okay, sure, I know that you're, you're raising your price to seem like you have more status, but you may also be doing it because that allows you to build new buildings or hire different faculty or whatever it is from, and when you're talking about the education industry. And so I think that it's possible that even being aware of it taking place is not gonna totally, totally crush the, the ability of that to actually work. The types of papers that I like to read kind of present a narrative, right? They present something in the social world that creates, that sets up for something that requires greater study, something that, that motivates inquiry, something that, that actually we encounter and the narrative brings it to life. Um, and so I, whenever I read papers, and this is totally personal preference, but like if I read a paper that the whole f first several paragraphs are just like, here's what the literature says about these things and here's where we're gonna sort of add to that. It's not that that's not valuable, I just don't find it as interesting. Um, because most of the time if the literature hasn't covered it, A, there might be a reason for that, or B, there's probably a story there that could actually bring it to life in a different way or in a, in, in a more engaging way. And so I think, you know, even the way that, that we wrote the, the Hot 100 paper in ASR, we started by asking, you know, what makes popular culture popular, right? At least it brings it to somewhat of a real world experiential thing. You sort of, you look around you, you see movies or songs or, or other creative products and wonder like, why does that one stand out or not. And, and yes, then we launch into a mostly literature-based kind of framing of that. But still, I, I think starting with some kind of narrative or real-world uh, experience or puzzle, um, Ezra Zuckerman does an amazing job with the front end of his papers as really, really motivating something based on a puzzle, both experientially, but also in the literature. And that's where I think, and look, very few people are, are as good as that, but like that I think is, is aspirational from writing, writing introductions and, and how you introduce theory and, and into, into the types of work we're doing. When I was a first year PhD student at Chicago, Ned Smith was a fifth year at Booth and he was, you know, super welcoming, helpful, friendly, um, and one of the things, he's like, if I could give you one piece of advice right now, learn R. And I was like, okay. At that, at that point in time, I didn't really know what that was, and that I, first piece of advice I would give to any PhD student first year, I would say, whether it's Python or R, or, you know, the sort of the statistical package language of your choice, start learning it right away.
um, even if you're more of a qualitative researcher, it can only help um, as just a means of dealing with the types of things and questions and data that we're going to be working with going forward. Um, and so that would be my single biggest piece of advice. Um, and as far as dealing with big data sets, uh, I mean, even after having kind of self-taught R and also taken some classes on it, we still had to hire programmers to help because we're talking about two million so uh, artists and 20 million, 30 million songs, and that's far beyond my capabilities. Um, and actually far beyond a lot of people's capabilities, it turns out, we went through a series of programmers and, and developers who just, we spent money on, turned out they didn't do a great job, didn't clean things appropriately, didn't, you know, got us in trouble with the companies we were getting data from sort of things. Um, and so I think even having a better knowledge, not necessarily knowing how to do it myself, but like having a better understanding of what the capabilities required were for dealing with big data um, and dealing with, with scraping data and interfacing with APIs, uh, the more you can be familiar with that, if you're doing any kind of quantitative work, the better off you're going to be.